All right, so uh, welcome everyone. Good evening and uh, Ohayo gozaimasu for those uh, in Japan. Um, I'm uh, Yves Tibergin, the co-director of the Center for Japanese Research uh, in the SPPGA, and it's a great uh, pleasure welcoming all of you. Uh, I will start by acknowledging that we are meeting today virtually on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Muskiam people, and in my case, the Coast uh, Salish Wassanek people. Mm. Um, I also want to start by thanking uh, Sayasan uh, for all the work in setting uh, up this uh, seminar. Um, and uh, Saya is a Palisai major, I am minor, uh, and her Furusato on the father side is the coolest place in Japan, Beibun Islands, for those of you who don't know it. Um, so welcome everyone. We're gonna have uh, a wonderful discussion today about insights, uh, insights and uh, all kinds of stories on uh, what's happening within Japanese politics on the Abe and we'll finish with Suga as well. Uh, and this is based on a wonderful book, one of the most insightful recent book on Japanese politics called The Iconoclast, Shinzo Abe in the New Japan, written by the author who is here with us, Tobias Harris. Um, if you haven't seen the book yet, no, here he is, but uh, Tobias will uh, show it, uh, I'm pretty sure. Uh, it's a truly uh, feat um, of analysis, updates, and empirical details uh, that really tell the story uh, of how, uh, how you know, Shinzo Abe uh, came back, you know, the story of Shinzo Abe is pretty dramatic because he was prime minister first and he crashed and burned, was in the wilderness and then came back and became the longest, the most uh, impactful modern prime minister in Japan. So uh, a very, very interesting story. And this is the, the best book uh, on, the, uh, on that story. Uh, Tobias Harris is a Japanese politics analyst at Tenio Intelligence the political risk arm of the strategic consultancy Tenio. Uh, this is his first book published in August 2020, just when uh, Prime Minister Abe was resigning. So this is also the best time book ever published in uh, Japanese <laughs> politics. Um, interestingly enough, uh, Tobias worked in 2006-2007 in, in the staff of a DPJ politician, uh, Asao Keiichiro. Uh, who was at the time in the upper house and he was the shadow foreign minister for the Democratic Party of Japan. So that's where uh, I got a lot of insights on how, you know, how Japanese politics work. Uh, he has earned the name Phil in IR from the University of Cambridge uh, and had studied before for his BA at Brandeis University. Uh, he has conducted graduate research at MIT uh, and at Shaken at Todai as a Fulbright scholar. Um, he is one of the most prolific writers on modern Japanese politics. Uh, you find his columns or his op-eds or his interviews in the Financial Times, Wall Street Journal, Foreign Affairs. He's also often on TV, CNBC, always Bloomberg and other network. Uh, and uh, for six years, he was the fellow for economy, trade and business at the Sasakoa Peace Foundation USA. Um, the book uh, really reviews the story of Shizo Abe, but there's a lot of context actually going back to the family roots. Um, and essentially tells this astonishing tale of how Abe uh, was resurrected after a terrible crash uh, to dominate Japanese democracy as no leader has done before. Um, and, how to, and how he tried to project a new image for Japan as a leading nation. Uh, so we're going to open the story in a sort of uh, fire chat style. Uh, and so I'll start with a bunch of questions with Tobias, and then we'll have an open Q&A afterwards. Uh, the chat function is disabled, so you can ask your questions instead in the Q&A window. Um, please note that this webinar and the Q&A session will be recorded. Uh, you're not required, however, to use your camera or microphone to participate in a Q&A session. Written questions can be submitted to everyone via the Q&A function and then upvoted by each of you. So you can look at all the, the questions that are being put and you can upvote the ones that you like. Uh, I will monitor the Q&A window and post questions using attendees' first names only. Um, so let us begin. Um, so I'll start uh, 
maybe with a, um, a simple question, which is, uh, you know, knowing what happened to Abe uh, in 2007, when he resigned with, you know, suddenly, abruptly, September 12, as he was sick uh, and disappeared for a while. Uh, so what did Abe do between 2007 and 2012? What is the hidden story of his revival and reinvention? And what can we learn from that story? That's, it's a great place to start. And also, Eve, thank you for the introduction. Thank you uh, to you and, and um, Soma-san and, and all the work you've done to make this possible. I really appreciate it. Happy to be here virtually uh, with at UBC and uh, wish I could have visited in person. Um, but that's a great place to start because it's sort of where the book started. I mean, I... I um, started, as you mentioned, so I've been with Taneo since uh, 2013. And so basically at that point became an Abe and an Abenomics watcher. And, and, and really, you know, I was taken, I was surprised by his comeback. I think a lot of people were surprised. Um, you know, I remember in 2012, I was, it was the, you know, Japan on a Fulbright and um, was invited or got an invitation to Abe giving a speech in June of 2012 and just decided to go see him. Not because I thought, you know, he was going to be prime minister by the end of the year, but, you know, more for nostalgia. You know, I remember 2006 and 2007 and, you know, just don't wanted to hear what he was up to. And, uh, and so I went and it was hot and there was no air conditioning and I was having a hard time staying awake and I don't remember anything he said. I mean, that's, um, and and if I had known he was going to be back a few months after that, I would have paid more attention. And so, I mean, it was really a remarkable story. I mean, that really is, is where I came into this because uh, it's just such an unusual thing for a politician to fail um, in the way that Abe failed in 2007. And, and you know, really not just not just losing uh, power and you know, being forced to resign, losing an election. Um, but after that, then having to admit, you know, he was admitted to the hospital. Uh, no one really knew why. And a little while after that, he writes this essay and he explains uh, that he had had uh, struggled with ulcerative colitis his entire life. Um, sort of a graphic description of, of the kind of symptoms that he was dealing with, the gastrointestinal symptoms. I mean, just the kind of thing that you usually do not see politicians anywhere and certainly not a Japanese politician sort of coming out and admitting. And, and I think it made him, uh, you know, the butt of jokes. And, and I think people kind of assumed that that was it, you know, that maybe... Um, you know, maybe he'd stay in the diet and he'd have a role to play sort of behind the scenes because there's, you know, often a role for uh, ex-prime ministers. But I don't think anyone really assumed that he'd have another shot um, at the premiership. Um, and but what ended up happening, I mean, some of it, I think, uh, was his own uh, self-reflection that, I, you know, I, I think he... Um, you know, he the, there's stories of how he um, how he found his confidence again. Uh, lots of his compatriots talk about the hiking trips they took, where you know they would go out and people would would wave to him and have nice nice things to say, and it made him feel like he could be a, a public figure again. Um, but he also you know, took copious notes, just sort of you know his self reflection notebooks he calls them, um, where you know was looking back on on what went wrong and what he learned, and so he really thought about it. Um, and he, you know, he was a good study. He, you know, I think one of the things that he really recognized was that he just did not have a strong enough grasp of, on economic policy, not, not just because, you know, you've got to be a policy wonk to be a prime minister, but I think, you know, you have to be able to convincingly discuss the issues that voters care about most. And, um, and, and he just didn't do that. And so I think part, you know, the, one of the most important parts of his reinvention um, was that process of kind of learning, uh, getting a grasp of economic policy, and then really um, uh, being introduced to the ideas of what later became Abenomics. And that, that happened later. Uh, the, the other piece of it, though, is I think he just was very lucky. Um, you know, if, if the LDP does not lose in 2009, it's hard to see how he had, how he would have come back. You know that the, the LDP's path might have gone a different way. You know, but the fact that you had the LDP losing power, you had a lot of um, uh, older LDP lawmakers and more moderate LDP law lawmakers who either lost or went into retirement. Um, you had his friend Nakagawa Shoichi lose his seat and then commit suicide, um, and that created space, I think, for someone you know to to lead the right. And, and I think you know I write about this in the book that that kind of fell to Abe. There was not really anyone better for that role. Um, and so Abe, you know, Abe, you know, had that opportunity. You know, and I think the DPJ made just failed in so many different ways in office. Um, and so that, you know, it looked as if the LDP was going to have its shot. Um, and the LDP, I think, needed a, an effective critique um, in, a, in a way really of distinguishing itself 
uh, from the DPJ. And, and Abe really stepped forward to provide that both in economic policy, but also just in more traditional area, you know, areas that he's known for hawkish foreign policy, um, you know, that, you know, needing to, to stand up for the national interest. And, and I think between how, what the DPJ did with the United States um, and sort of Hatoyama, Hatoyama's missteps in 2009 and 2010, and then the, the, DPJ struggles to deal with China, uh, both in, 20, in 2010 and 2012. I mean, it just created an opening for a politician like Abe. Um, and, and the chips just kind of fell into place. I mean, and then you look at the LDP race in 2012, and everything just kind of lined up. Um, and he was able to win uh, in the second round of voting. And, and so it was sort of almost like this, um, this primrose path. I mean, everything kind of just fell into place. And he got very lucky. Um, and, and all of a sudden, you know, there he was leading a party uh, that was favored to win in the election in 2012 and, and came back into power. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating. So the other key piece, of course, of his return to power uh, is the Abenomics idea. I remember watching 2012, you know, in September, there was still a bit of skepticism. He was really this nationalist, hawkish politician. And then in the fall, suddenly the, the, the story of Abenomics and, and then the expression of what he would do with the central bank comes out and gradually kind of attracts voters. Yeah. Uh, I've argued that the election was really won on that, but uh, right. I, you know, not everyone agrees. Uh, but I'm curious, wh what, how did the Abenomics and the Three Arrows really come together? Who were, you know, is it all about uh, this professor from Yale? Uh, or, you know, who, who were the key players here and, and how did the story come together? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's um, you know, in the book I write about them, you know, that that they're almost like a, a group of outcasts, you know, it's this kind of collection of misfits and um, uh, Yamamoto Kozo in the LDP is, is you know, sort of the, the leading, um, you know, Abe sort of um, guru within the LDP, you know, that he um, kind of connected with Abe and then was the was the conduit for all of these academics to to have a, a way of meeting Abe and, and brief him and really um, you know basically become his, his economics tutors. Um, but you know it was really it was this collection of people who had been pushing the same line for years, right? It's not like these ideas uh, came out of nowhere. Um, a lot of you know a lot of it was uh, the influence of economists outside of Japan, and so you know the kind of arguments that people like. Uh, Paul Krugman and, and Adam Posen have been making about Japan for a very long time, or Ben Bernanke, another name, um, you know, people who've been saying, um, you know, the Bank of Japan just really needed to be more aggressive and more assertive. And, and you know, that that this is not, you know, that basically it wasn't a mystery um, that you just needed uh, your uh, uh, policy regime change. And, and, you know, the problem was that all of these intellectual outcasts who um, you know, who basically had been rejected by the BOJ and whose re ideas have been rejected by the Ministry of Finance, um, they never had a political champion. And so it was this marriage of convenience after uh, the 311 triple disasters, which really was, I mean, that was really the key turning point in the development of Abenomics, um, that you had uh, Yamamoto Kozo you know, was pushing for, um, you know, an aggressive um, you know, basically what ended up being Abenomics sort of an aggressive, fisc coordinated fiscal uh, monetary approach. You know, essentially uh, the Japanese government would, would pay for it with debt and the Bank of Japan would buy it. Um, you know, it's really pushing for the DPJ government to take that approach. Um, but I think Yamamoto felt that uh, they didn't really have someone who had enough presence and was going to attract enough attention. Um, and, you know, and at this point, Abe had re-entered the political arena um, you know, was was active again, was giving speeches, was on TV a lot, um, but still hadn't quite, you know, was still just, you know, the, the defense hawk, the constitution revision guy, still wasn't really an economics person. Um, and somehow uh, the connection was made from Yamamoto to Abe, and they talked. Um, and Abe sort of, I think, had a light bulb go on. And I think there's evidence that when Abe had been go in government during the Koizumi years, <laughs> That at least instinctively he sort of got the reflationist critique, but you know even if he didn't have kind of you know a lot of the substance, um, and you know and I think that connection was made. Yamamoto asked him to chair this group, um, and then uh, you look and and Abe just just it stuck. You know something something happened and Abe really um, picked up the ideas and and um, you know again this is mentioning mention, I mentioned this in the book. I mean a way of um, seeing Abe change. Um, Abe had been writing this column for the uh, Yukon Fuji, which is, you know, this uh, right-wing tabloid, you know, part of the, the Fuji Sanke um, empire. And so he was writing a column, like a monthly or maybe a couple times a month. And before 311, nothing about economics, nothing about anything that, and you know, ended up you know, becoming Abenomics. And then sort of after he chairs this group, 
I mean, the number, you know, the number of times where he's talking about monetary policy, you're talking about the Bank of Japan, you know, all of a sudden it's, it's, a, it's a regular topic uh, of his column. And that was really something you've never seen before at any point in his career. You know, this is someone who's going to talk about foreign policy. We'll talk about the abductees. We'll talk about the Constitution. We'll talk about U.S.-Japan relations. Um, just you really did not have much of a record um, of, you know, having thought about these issues. And, you know, sort of the zeal of a convert, I mean, he really took to them. Um, and so then, you know, by the time he becomes LDP leader, you know, it becomes clear that that's going to be his group. You know, he has this group now of advisors around him, um, including, you know, sympathetic, uh, other sympathetic people within the LDP. I mean, people who were ended up being a lot more powerful than Yamamoto. Um, and, and that really was the team that came together after Abe uh, became the LDP leader again in September 2012. And then the market started saying, OK, wait, we might actually get um, a different sort of policy if the LDP uh, wins power and if we get an Abe government and then you know I, I think you know you just kind of watch what the markets did and and everything just um, you know went from there yeah that, that is a fascinating story um, and so now turning to the Abe politics of the style of governance um, so of course now everyone says that this incredible sort of uh, control that Abe has had for seven years with almost no gravity. There was no more gravity in Japanese politics. Nothing, nothing really could stop him. He was <laughs> winning every election and there was no real opposition, right? So it, it became a sort of new normal for a few years. I mean, when it was like, it looked obvious he was in control, right? But we know, we know now when we see Suga and we know that six Minister for him, the rules that he had, you know, after electoral reform, after uh, administrative reforms, a strong Kante, he did add the personal law, which added uh, more tools, but uh, he used the tools in a better way than everyone else. So what really explained this lack of political gravity during Abe? How did he put all this together, right? In a way that nobody, well, Koizumi to some extent, but nobody had done it so well. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I think there's still, I mean, there's still a lot of luck involved. I mean, some, you know, that... Um, you know, the, the, some, to some extent, the story of Abe's failure in 2006, 2007 was because Japan actually was in the process of, you know, becoming a two-party democracy. I mean, you really did have um, a credible opposition party for the first time. I mean, the DPJ wins in 2000, 2007, in part because people were willing um, to give it a shot, you know, that a DPJ led by Ozawa all of a sudden looked like a much more um, credible potential ruling party. And, and, you know, so there was so much more pressure on the LDP um, than ever before. And so, you know, but Abe, of course, you know, comes back to power in 2012 and the DPJ essentially has destroyed itself in power. You know, um, you know, Ozawa had left the party, and, you know, as part of a you know, result, uh, a revolt against Noda's decision on the consumption tax earlier that year. Um, you know, the, the party had no idea what it wanted to be after losing power. Um, you know, it went through a series of pretty lackluster leaders. Um, it, it just, it, it, it lost, I think, all the trust that it had gained um, during its rise um, and sort of the decade leading up to its election in 2009. Um, and so that, I mean, that just created a ton of space for Abe to work with, you know, that, um, you know, he just did not have to worry nearly as much. And that, I think, gave him a free hand also to time um, snap elections, right? If you don't really have to worry uh, that you're going you're gonna to lose your majority, um, you have you've a lot more freedom about um, about how to time an election. So 2014, you know, he's embroiled in a in a intra-party fight um, over taxes and fiscal policy, and he's able to use the snap election um, to win that fight uh, because he doesn't have to worry about the opposition. And so, I mean, we shouldn't um, underestimate the the extent to which the fact that the opposition really never was able to get its act together. Um, and, you know, and, and not just wasn't able to get its act together, but really the public just um, was not willing to trust them with power. And, and, and that, I think, matters a lot. Um, and I think related to that, and I've written about this, that, you know, that you had, um, it wasn't just, you know, that the first decade of the century was this period of um, really vibrant two-party competition and, you know, elections that really were characterized by, um, you know, two big parties battling um, for seats. Um, you know, that it was also, you know, very, you know, sort of populist, right? You know, that between Koizumi and the DPJ, um, you had sort of populist tinged policies, you know, and, and, you know, throw the bums out and attack the bureaucrats and attack the entrenched interests. And I think that, you know, helped drive up turnout. I mean, I think in, in 2005 and in 2009, you had some very, you know, some of the highest turnout you had, you'd had, um, you know, in, in almost two decades at that point. Um, 
And, and, you know, and I think so there was a lot of energy in politics, there was a lot of excitement, a lot of independents came out to vote, um, you know, that, that, you know, as you had two parties that were sort of competing to be the mantle, you know, for the mantle of who, who's going to be the real reformer. Um, and I think, you know, again, part of the, the legacy of the DPJ years was a lot of that energy, I think, was just exhausted that, you know, you sort of had a post populist fatigue. And, and Abe, I think, benefited from that, that, you know, independents, you know, the, the, for me, the most salient fact of elections during the Abe years is that turnout was, if it wasn't a record low, it was a near record low in, in pretty much every election. And so um, that just tells you, you know, that Abe won because he was able to get LDP and Komeito voters out um, in sort of normal strength. Um, and for the most part, you know, the opposition couldn't get the independence out that it would need um, to win elections against the LDP. And so that really, you know, Abe really was the beneficiary of, of a kind of exhaustion with that kind of politics, a, a, I think a desire for stability. Um, and he delivered that. And I think the more, you know, that you, you did get something of a virtuous cycle, that the more uh, he delivered upon that desire for stability, you know, the more, the higher his popularity, or at least the, the more stable his popularity, which enabled him to win elections and have a stable majority and to continue to deliver um, on that promise. And, and I think, you know, he was willing to take risks, I think, at, at various points in time, and we can talk about sort of the policies he was willing to take risks on. But he always, I think he sort of understood that there was a, a point past which he, he couldn't push without jeopardizing his majority. And, and I think he got that. And I think, um, that was another lesson, I think, of his time in the wilderness. But um, yeah, so so clearly, I think his political acumen was part of it. But we shouldn't ask to underestimate the extent to which just he was the beneficiary of some really um, convenient and, and congenial circumstances. Mm. Um, can you uh, give us insights of how uh, you know his decision making machine would would work? You know, for a given part, imagine he wants to start a policy. Who? Who has most influence in, in uh, working with him? Is it his inner political circle? Is it uh, Meti? Uh, was it shifted from a more political circle initially? There was rumors that he worked with a Facebook group of very faithful people that were, you know, and he spent a lot of time on social media with that group. <laughs> uh, or was it a, a few personal advisor, the Imai or the others that, yeah. that he trusted? Or Suga, or was it all Suga managing the machinery? <laughs> Uh, versus the bureaucracy, right? We know Meti had a lot of influence, but then on consumption tax, especially 2019, right? This can only be a sign of Muff having fingerprint in there, right? So how, what, who, were, who are the players? Who is making policy in the kitchen here? <laughs> um, well, I mean, I think, you know, the, the most important innovation, um, you know, beyond the, the Cabinet Personnel Bureau, which you mentioned, um, which really was, I think, an important innovation because it meant that, um, you know, you that, and you talk to bureaucrats, I mean, they will confirm that it was an, an extremely important innovation. And it did lead to, I think, some of the scandals in the later years. But, um, you know, the fact is that um, it enabled the government, you know, the, the political leaders, um, Abe and his advisors, to really reach um, down into the bureaucracy and influence the behavior of bureaucrats, even levels below people, you know, below the levels that they were influenced or directly controlling. Um, because everyone had to think about, am I doing things that are going to make my political masters happy? And it, you know, at the time, people warned that that was going to be an issue. Um, so I think, I mean, I think it's worth stressing what that meant. I mean, really, that um, you did have, I think, um, political control in the ministries um, in ways that you hadn't had before. But when it came to decision making, again, this is one of those lessons learned, I think, um, you know, from um, from the first premiership. You know, that you did not have really a an effective um, kind of decision making chamber um, in the first Abe government, you know, that the people in the Conte, you know, that that um, it, you had a lot of personalities, uh, none was really strong enough to prevail and to propose you know, to impose discipline. I mean, you had someone like Yoshio know, Ozaki uh, was the chief cabinet secretary in 2006, 2007. And, um, you know, people just yeah, he, I think he rubbed people the wrong way. You know, I think he uh, kind of had a reputation as a know-it-all. Um, you know, his skill set was not the kind of skill set that you necessarily need to be a successful chief cabinet secretary. He had the policy, you know, he sort of had the policy ideas and, and the expertise, but did not have the relationships necessarily. And so, yeah, I mean, Suga brought a whole different set of, um, of skills to that role, um, you know, that, you know, extensive connections throughout the bureaucracy, uh, extensive connections throughout the ruling coalition, you know, and, and really being able to um, make people 
uh, follow when they needed to follow. Um, you know, I think, you know, a command of, you know, for detail, you know, uh, the work ethic that we, I think, heard about, um, you know, as, as we were getting reintroduced to Suga um, during the campaign and sort of immediately after. Um, I mean, I think all of these, all of these qualities, you know, sort of, um, you know, you know, a workhorse and not a show horse. You know, I think Shiozaki kind of always thought that he was going to be prime minister one day and, and um, you wanted, um, I think, plenty of credit for himself. And I think there was always, there was always a sense um, that Suga wasn't, um, you know, he wasn't out there um, trying to lay the groundwork for his own ascendancy. And, and in fact, I think for that reason, I think a lot of people wrote off uh, his likelihood. I mean, I, I certainly did. I mean, um, I had, I'd kind of assumed that, um, you know, Suga either didn't want it or just was not nearly the kind of, you know, not the right kind of figure for the premiership. And I guess he proved us all wrong. Um, but for, you know, for almost eight years, I mean, he was really willing to, to do the dirty work and to really um, um, do a lot of the work of controlling the bureaucracy that made Abe's government function. Um, but what you also had was Suga as part of um, a small group of people at the highest levels of government. So it was Suga, it was the deputy chief cabinet secretaries, it was uh, Abe's principal, principal uh, private secretary, Imai, who you mentioned. Um, so that, you know, what, and, and what they did, they would meet um, pretty much every day, I mean, very regularly, and would coordinate on, you know, what are the, you know, what are the kind of key issues before the government? Um, I think they, they coordinated on messaging so that there, you know, there was always kind of a, co a consistent um, message, which, you know, Nsuga in his role as chief cabinet secretary was in front of the press twice a day. Um, so there was, I think, just much more, there was message discipline, there was a sense of a decision-making process and, um, you know, debate. You know, this wasn't just, you know, Abe, you know, would tell them what to do. I mean, I think there was a genuine debate about the direction of the government. And so Abe, I think, had people around him who, um, you know, maybe, you know, they weren't necessarily strenuously disagreeing, but I think they were um, trying to, you know, if they thought he was making mistakes, pushed him in, in different directions. Um, and, you know, and, and I think that that really benefited Abe. I think um, there were people around him who were um, checking some of his more ideological impulses. I mean, there's a you know, story of Suga himself has, has talked about how he uh, tried to convince Abe not to go to Yasukuni in 2013. I mean, he failed in that instance, but it gives you a flavor of, of the kind of um, guidance that Suga was providing Abe. And, and I, so I think, you know, the, the, the fact that you had different uh, a different, you actually had a process around Abe, you had more experienced people, uh, people who, who, brought different skills to their roles than, um, than had happened in 2006, 2007. And I think all of that made for just a much more effective government. Mm. Yeah, th that is fascinating. Uh, in this regard, maybe can you say a couple words on ASSO? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> when, uh, you know, early on, especially, ASSO made some incredible, you know, like, remarks, right, including praising the Nazis uh, uh, and, and a bunch of things he did with respect to Korea or other things, right, uh, that even shocked the Americans, let alone the uh, Asian neighbors. Uh, it seemed that they got a bit more under control and ASSO remained always part of the co-group. I was actually surprised. I never thought ASSO could stay that long as such a, a core member when he was so uh, prone, right, to unusual comments <laughs> i mean i th i think the also abe relationship is is interesting and, and something i wish i had i had covered a little more in the book and and alas i couldn't uh cover everything but um you know it's it's i mean clearly you know i think they respect each other their, their relationship goes back a long way you know i think they um you know are part of the same universe i mean they're different generations i mean also is you know a good um, decade and a half or so older than Abe, um, you know, and also was kind of from a different generation of LDP politician. But um, you know, I, I think at the same time, I mean, I, I think there was always a sense that if Aso was out of government, there's the potential for him to cause trouble. Um, you know, that you know maybe he he wouldn't be, uh, you know, that he would be sort of looking out for himself or his faction. Um, and, you know, you're giving him the finance ministry. I mean, um, you know, given that he had been a former prime minister, he had to have something of, of suitable stature, um, you know, and I think he brought um, sort of the right skills to it. I also always had the sense, though, um, that also um, was, all, I mean, in some ways he seemed more, you um, captured by the finance ministry 
than necessarily his own man. That it always seemed like, you know, when there were debates about the consumption tax or fiscal policy, I mean, he was he was always um, following the finance ministry line. That it, you know, there didn't seem like there were too many instances um, where he was um, he was a uh, kind of a maverick and, and going his own way. I mean, he really um, seemed that seemed to be the role that he played during the Abe years. Um, you know, I think, you know, I think Abe always felt that he could go to him for political advice. And um, you look at Abe's schedule and whenever a big political decision uh, was coming up, I mean, you, there were always, you know, dinners with Aso on, on the schedule. And so I think, um, you know, I, I think um, he's someone who Abe always felt he could look to uh, for advice, but it's, it was not, you know, this not the closest relationship Abe had. I mean, always, um, I mean, Aso was just too ambitious and too, um independent of a politician for it to be an easy relationship um, and a simple relationship. But I, but I do think, you know, they were allies. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to, to make sure we covered the, the China puzzle, uh, the Abe China puzzle, because Abe came in, you know, you know, in the wake of all the battle about the disputed islands and uh, really with a nationalist message uh, and initially some very, very strong remarks, you no know, focus on, uh, you know, reasserting Japan as a, as a, you know, as a great power, as a, an important nation, uh, and pushing back on China in every way, right, every direction, uh, and so the under Obama actually, it was he, he was always more hawkish than the American position, and in fact, you know, there have been memoirs out of the Obama administration that they were always worried about Abe, how to check Abe. They were afraid Abe would drive them into a war with China, right? There was that kind of. So we go from there to. You know, suddenly under Trump is the reverse. You know, Abe now is checking the Americans on China, uh, and so they cross each other, and he ends up uh, while still, of course, being strong on defense and on rule of law and islands. Uh, at the same time, he builds those astonishing economic relationships that you know the foundation of RCEP, for example, very uh, a list of success of the G20 in Osaka with China that even uh, you know like our Canadian G20 chef I was surprised about. You know, in January that year, you would never expect what you end up having in the Osaka summit. So, and he, and he gradually devised this pragmatic approach with China. So how, it, and he got praised, right? When he uh, stepped down by the Chinese. Right. Uh, that was <laughs> unbelievable after they were so mad at him when he was appointed, right? So what, what, went, what went on and what were the triggers? What were maybe the people that helped him do that transformation? Is it uh, about Nikai or is it about particular events, uh, trigger events? So how, how did we have this, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think you can think of the first, mm -hmm. you know, the, the first years, you know, you really have to think about what he inherited and, you know, that, that really, you know, he was elected, um, you know, having, you know, lambasted the DPJ for mishandling, um, the you know the 2010 uh, fishing boat collision and then 2012 the the uh, purchase of of the islands and the nationalization of the islands um, and the you know that you know, all of a sudden you know, you have a more assertive China and you know feeling that the DPJ rolled over instead of um, defending Japan's national interests and so you know and I, and I think you know during the early years I think there was a a, a need to signal that Japan would not be pushed around. Um, and, and really to reestablish uh, deterrence, which is why, you know, in U.S.-Japan relations during those years, you know, one of the most important developments was the fact that you had an, you know, increasingly senior uh, officials in the Obama administration signaling that, yes, Article 5 of the Security Treaty applies to the Senkakus. Um, you, know, you know, we are going to be uh, involved in deterring China. And the fact that um, you had the uh, defense guidelines updated, really focused on these gray zone scenarios. Um, you know, and then finally, Obama himself um, reiterating uh, the Article 5 commitment. And, and so, you know, I think really we have to look at it through that lens that, um, you know, concerns that, um, you know, because of the DPJ's mismanagement of relations with China, that, um, you know, the deterrence had weakened, you had, you had China re you know, establishing its ages in 2013. Um, so, you know, that I think there was, you know, I think Abe, I think there was a sense that there was a lot of work to do. Um, and, you know, by 2016, 2017, certainly after Trump is elected, um, yeah, okay, you know, it's maybe less less about, you know, how do we deter China? And how, and now it's a, how do we actually safeguard uh, an area where we have shared um, economic interests, you know, that we, you know, we are committed to, you know, we both have an interest in, um, you know, 
an open trading regime, you know, we, you know, and, and uh, resisting protectionism and making sure that uh, global integration continues. And, and I think that was some of it. Uh, I think a lot of it was the Japanese business community um, kind of pushing on the Abe government to say, okay, you know, it's gone far enough. It's really time to, um, you know, to protect this. And, and I think Meti also was pushing in the same way. So, um, you know, this, this infamous episode where, uh, his uh his secretary Imai, um you know kind of tinkering with this letter that um, Nikai was bringing to Xi Jinping at the Belt and Road Forum in 2017, and the finance minister, uh, foreign ministry got wind of it, and uh, yeah, and Yachi, the national security advisor, got wind of it, and there was a shouting match between them. I mean, um, you know, stories like that. I mean, there's other, this was not necessarily uh, something that was. Um, a consensus approach within the government. But I mean, I think a lot of it did have to do with economic interests. I mean, I think, I think also though, it's really helpful to think um, about Japan's relations with China in this way. I mean, when we look, we're sort of looking at the U S and how the U S has approached Asia, um, you know, that the oftentimes Asia policy is China policy and everything kind of follows from China policy. And, and so, you know, you go to Southeast Asia and, and, you know, you say, well, you know, don't take Belt and Road money, you know, because, you know, all those strings attached and it's debt trap diplomacy, you know, and it's always, it's, it's about telling Southeast Asia how bad China is, or, you know, it's about, you know, we need uh, the TPP because we need, we need to write the rules and China doesn't. I mean, and, you know, what I think for Japan, um, when Japan looks at Asia, um, they see, you know, I think Japan really centers Southeast Asia in its Asia policy, and it really is focused on how do we uh, ensure, you know, actually, it's exactly what what it says, uh, free and open Indo-Pacific. You know, how do you have um, free in the sense of national independence and, you know, the, you know, ensuring that countries in the region um, have their autonomy and are not kind of pressured uh, politically and militarily and economically by China? So how do you ensure kind of national independence? And how do you ensure that you have open um economic, you know, open commerce and open sea lanes. And, and those really are the goals. And it's not about, you know, we're going to bash China and we have to find a way to change China's behavior. It's, these are our goals. And there are going to be some areas where we're going to push back on China. We're going to say China's not following the rules. Um, but oftentimes, I mean, the goal really is what can Japan do for the country, for, you know, for the countries of Southeast Asia or India, um, or you know, just sort of the Indian Ocean Rim in general, what can Japan do to further this goal of a free and open Indo-Pacific? And I think what Japan realized over time um, was that, you know, that, that there are areas, you know, there are ways in which um, you can maybe co-opt Chinese power. That, it, you know, that yes, you, know, you want to provide an alternative to Chinese money and to Chinese influence and to give these countries a choice. Um, but I think what Japan recognized when it when it started talking with China from 2017 onward, you know, their focus really was um, on, on kind of, at first it looked like it was going to be cooperation officially under the Belt and Road, and then it became kind of infrastructure cooperation in third countries. Um, but, you know, that how can you, you know, China has this money, um, they're going to be involved, they're going to use it, there's nothing you can, you can't make them not do it, and you can't really tell countries in the region not to take it if, you know, they have needs that need to be filled. And so I think there was a, a, a an attempt on Japan's part to try to shift China, um, China's behavior in a direction that was sort of more in line um, with Japan's interests and Japan's principles. You know, Japan had, had articulated this quality infrastructure approach. And so that was really the center of Japan's approach to these bilateral discussions with China, um, you know, really trying to get cooperation on Japanese terms in third countries. And, you know, since that, you know, why not? If I mean, China's willing to play by these rules, um, you know, that, that only, you know, can strengthen you know the the independence and and the the economic prosperity um, of these countries and and so really I mean I think that really is the way to think about um, you know Japan's approach to China that um, you know if there are areas to work with them then they'll work with them I mean that that you know and of course that doesn't mean they're not going to worry about the East China Sea it doesn't mean they're not going to worry about the South China Sea uh, it doesn't mean they're not going to worry about China's military power um, but that you can find you know that that within that you can still find areas of cooperation. Yeah, that's great. Uh, and um, so a, a, re a related uh, paradox in the, around Abe is uh, how he moved from being, you know, in the early years of Abe years, uh, people, uh, liberal Democrats the world over were a little concerned, right? Because there was uh, some crackdown on the media, on NHK, there was, and, and a lot of very, very hawkish statements that looked like they could destabilize Asia. So initially that's the image of Abe, 
is he going to really work for the you know the liberal international order and all this and then we go from that phase to post 2017 he become one of the strongest leader actually in the liberal international order uh you know on trade nobody has done more than japan at a, and with systemic impact but across the board on democracy on g20 on he's attached to speak a lot about climate we'll, we'll get back to climate afterwards but at least he talks about it i mean so uh, across the board we, we start to see a very different abe that becomes a standard bearer for the liberal international order when when the us has gone the other way uh, what again? What triggered this transformation? This remarkable transformation. Mm. Well, I mean, I think I think I, I I mean I don't I don't necessarily credit Abe that much on the the liberal side of that. At least on the the political, you know that I, I you know I you know on human rights on democracy promotion. I mean that has never necessarily been the priority. I mean and and you know I mean look Japan has been comfortable working with me with with Myanmar. Um, you know good relations with Vietnam. I mean democracy. You know, Japan, I think, is not, you know, is not going to let democracy get in the way of of cooperating, you know, to, of pursuing its interests in the region. I mean, that's just the reality of it. Um, you know, and, you know, and of course, but if you know that there are, there's lots of focus, I think, on ties with other democracies. There's no question, um, you know, with India, with Australia, you know, I think there's been a, a you know a prioritization of of stronger ties with Europe, um, but not just you know, and, and of course, there are plenty of people who've noted that Abe actually enjoyed. Um, close, you know, closer personal ties with, with, uh, with strong men, you know, with Erdogan and, um, you know, with Modi, I mean, you know, and, and some of that could be taken too far, but the point is, I mean, that it was never, I think for Abe about, um, democracy promotion or, or human rights promotion. I mean, but the, um, the open international order maybe is, is how to think about it. You know, that I, I think there was a recognition, um, from, um, you know, from pretty much from the beginning of Abe's tenure, you know, sort of a recognition that um, Japan's economic future, its prosperity really depended on being open to the world in ways that it really hadn't been before. And, you know, he really was um, a globalizer uh, as a matter of, of kind of national interest. I mean, whether or not he's, um, you know, a, a dyed in the wool globalist, I, you know, I, you know, I, I'm not the man himself, you know, I can't tell you exactly what's in his heart, but I do think you know, there was a recognition that, you know, Japan really had um, to be willing to open itself to the world in ways that it hadn't been before, um, you know, to survive uh, in the 21st century. And, and so, you know, really from the beginning of his second administration, I mean, that was sort of a consistent thread, um, you know, that repeatedly, you know, pursuing policies that open Japan to, to trade, to investment, uh, to migrants uh, in ways that it just hadn't, or to migrants, to, I should say, tourists too, of course, um, that being a big part of it. And, you know, just, you know, that, that more interaction with international influences in every way, um, you know, than you had really ever seen before. Um, and, and that was, you know, a deliberate choice. Um, Suga, I think, was a really big part of that, because I think, if anything, he's... Um, even more committed to that approach and maybe more of a globalist um, than, uh, than Abe is um, instinctively. Um, but that was really a consistent approach. And, and so, um, I mean, I think it required winning some battles and, and you know, and the story of how um, you know, Abe brings Japan into the TPP talks, um, despite the fact that he was elected on, on an LDP majority, uh, many of whose members uh, had campaigned in opposition to the DPJ's interest in joining TPP. Um, you know, so, you know, the fights to bring Japan in, then to keep Japan in and to kind of win the battles um, against you know, the agricultural lobby as those talks were going on. Um, and then, you know, to get the deal done and then to, to bring the talks, you know, to bring TPP back after the U.S. left. I mean, all of that, um, you know, is just sort of uh, this illustration of just how much Japan changed um, on this front um, under Abe's leadership. Um, and, and it really is probably the single most important thing because it's very hard to see Japan going back uh, to what Maria Solis calls, you know, uh, its defensive um, approach to trade negotiations, you know, that Japan really does now see uh, its vocation as pushing, um, you know, higher standard uh, trade and investment rules in the region and globally forward. I mean, you know, bringing back TPP, I mean, yes, without the U.S. in it, um, its economic weight isn't quite what it would have been otherwise, uh, but it still remains um, you know, pretty much the, the gold standard now. And you see the countries that are now lining up, um, you know, and, and 
considering joining. Um, and, and between that and the uh, bilateral FTA with the, with the EU, um, it almost looks like a way of um, a kind of a roundabout way of getting the, uh, the advanced rules that you weren't able to get in a WTO round. And so, you know, the, the multi multilateral level, um, you know, Doha round fails, you don't really have any way of, of working through that. Um, but it does look like some of the wealthiest countries in the world are finding a way of working around that. And so if, you know, the UK joins TPP, that's a major uh, step forward. You know, South Korea now has, has hinted that it might be interested in joining TPP. China suggested, I mean, I don't take that that seriously because I think they're a long way off from being able to join. But the point is, I mean, aspirationally now TPP is the best game in town. And Japan really is, I think, um, basically, I mean, with Australia, the undisputed leaders of the bloc. And so, uh, I mean, that is a major development in the region um, and globally that I, I think is going to last up it. So we, uh, before we turn to Suga, uh, we should say a word about COVID <laughs> and, uh, and, and your uh, afterward. <laughs> uh, so here too, there is a bit of a paradox, uh, which is, uh, you know, I actually just finished a, a, a little comparative book on COVID in Asia. And uh, when you do tables comparing everything, uh, even though the, the numbers are not too bad in Japan, we're at 18 deaths per million, uh, Korea is at 10, uh, and then Taiwan is under one, Vietnam under one, etc. So it's higher than the others, but it's better than anyone uh, in the G7, as you write. Uh, nonetheless, uh, Japan did not do, you know, the sort of five to seven things that every other Asian neighbors did, mm -hmm. which is set up a very powerful central unit immediately, mm -hmm. uh, use a very strict early messaging and then quarantine and then contact tracing, very active contact tracing, mm -hmm. all the stuff that would eradicate. There was a lot of, haphazard, as you write, very haphazard policymaking, even more so when it came to uh, anything from Abino Mass to the economic policy and all this. Uh, in the end, so the next the next puzzle is, despite not doing all the things that seem to be the recipe for success, Japan lands pretty okay anyway, uh, maybe because the people did it on their own by wearing masks and, and the medical system is so strong. But um, still, it's so puzzling that the man that invented the best and the strongest prime minister's office uh, that was so on top of all the security crisis was not on top of this one. Uh, so what, what's the story? What's the paradox? Uh, what explains this bit mystery here? Mm. I mean, it's, it, you know, and I think it's, it's that story still is yet to really be written, you know, in terms of what went, what went wrong. I mean, I think some of it was timing, you know, that, um, you know, came at a moment when, um, you know, the, the scandal right now that Abe is, is once again embroiled in, I mean, you know, that, um, you know, it was really, it was probably the, the most, uh, serious scandal he'd really faced at that point because it really hit close to him. You know, there was a real uh, potential legal consequence, you know, as we're finding, I mean, you know, potential violations of the um, political funds control law are, are, you know, serious and have gotten lots of people into trouble in the past. And so, you know, I think that they had been so preoccupied um, fighting off um, those allegations and the fact too um you know, the real problem with that scandal also, and, and there were various articles uh, earlier in the year talking about this, um, you know, that it was a scandal that um, also it, it had Suga embroiled in ways that he hadn't been previously. And so you had, um, you know, the, the top two decision makers in the government um, sort of caught up in this um, and kind of, and, and um, by all accounts at odds with each other, and they weren't, you know, necessarily coordinating nearly as well um, you know, some of it also, I think, was that you just, you know, it's a government that was entering, you know, that was, um, you know, in its eighth year. Um, I, you know, I think you just didn't have um, the, you know, it wasn't, you know, the cabinets by that point, you know, you're getting people who were there because, um, you know, they, they, it was their turn. It wasn't necessarily, you know, this was not, you know, the, a top, you know, a-list LDP, you know, experts and, you know, highly respected officials. I mean, these cabinets were kind of weaker, um, shallower, and I, and I don't think that helped. Um, you know, I think to some extent there's, you know, that, um, you know, was Abe fatigued maybe coming into the year and, you know, that he had been battling all these scandals for a couple of years um, and, you know, just couldn't focus on this. Um, and so all of that, I think, didn't help with the timing. Um you know, I, you know, and I, and I wonder too, the other, the other factor, and, and this gets also to your question too, about, you know, the strongest prime minister's office, you know, that it also exposed the ways in which, um, 
you know, for all the strength that the prime minister's office has accumulated, it actually revealed ways in which the, you know, the national government's power uh, was actually still quite limited, you know, that, um, you know, it wasn't a matter of, you know, does Japan impose a lockdown or not? It was, well, we actually don't have the power uh, to do this. I mean, you know, that and early on, you know, you get uh, the law rewritten to, you know, to be able to, to declare a state of emergency, but then you look at the actual, what that actually means. And it's, well, you know, that we can't actually coerce anyone to do anything. It's still like, like this is extra strong power to ask people to, to do things or businesses to close. I mean, so, um, you know, I, I, I think, um, you know, that really revealed the limits of national power in a way that we really hadn't necessarily thought about. Although if you look at issues like like nuclear power, I think we saw those limits, I think, repeatedly pretty clear, you know, that uh, localities and courts were able to actually constrain the Abe government's ability um, to restart nuclear power plants. And so we did have some sense um, that actually, you know, the national government is still limited in a lot of ways. And, and um, there are constraints, um, you know, that this is not just about, you know, okay, Abe has a majority in the diet, he can do whatever he, whatever he wants. I think the other thing that is maybe unappreciated, certainly when it comes to, um, when we think less about the, the public health side of the pandemic, and more just about, um, you know, the broader political consequences and the economic story. I mean, I think the extent to which um, there was real trouble getting money distributed to people um, was maybe underappreciated to, as a factor in Abe's polling, um, you know, falling in the spring and, and the summer and really not recovering um, before he resigned and, and really the pressure he was under. Um, and, and it really also explains um, the prioritization of digitalization that we've seen under Suga, you know, that I think they really realized we are not ready like, you know, if we want to move quickly and distribute um, money quickly, we do not have the machinery to do that. You know, we, you know, that they were, um, I think, caught flat footed. And, and to some extent, I mean, I, you know, it's, I have not had conversations to this effect, although I would be very interested to learn if this was a factor. But, the, you know, that you look at South Korea um, and, you know, the, the speed with which South Korea was able to distribute um, cash to households and to businesses, um, you know, put, you know, frankly, from where I was sitting, puts Japan to shame. I mean, you know, that South Korea's response was so much more effective across the board. Um, I don't know. I don't think that was a factor maybe on, on the public opinion side, but I do wonder within Kasumi Gaseki, within Nagata Cho, you know, that, that I think they're always thinking about South Korea and um, kind of using South Korea as a yardstick. And I have to imagine that that had to be um, part of some of the discussions sort of within the government about lessons learned. Um, but all of that, I mean, I just think it all points to uh, reasons why the Abe government's uh, response was just not nearly as sharp and effective um, as it could have been. And I think it's part of the reason why why it really contributed um, to the, the, I guess, the, the physical pressure that Abe found himself under um, by the summer. Mm. So a, a few words to Suga before we open up to Q&A. Uh, I'm pretty sure you're preparing the future Suga book or or maybe it'll be part. We don't know how long it's going to last, but you no, know, he's got his, his one one year job for now. Um, uh, maybe. Uh, well, first, there is the uh, the, the scandal. Um, you know, you may want to say about the National Science Council. Uh, what how did this happen so early, you know, right in his first months uh, that he would end up vetoing six people? Uh, and Abe hadn't done it three years before, you know, so even was it a leftover from Abe or not? And how, how much of a cost is there? And then we'd love to hear more on the climate story because, uh, you know, it's a big thing, 2050 net neutrality. Of course, Korea did it as well at the same time and Xi Jinping did it at the UN. Uh, so they're exactly the same months, right? All three of them. Uh, and so is there a competitive dynamic going on? Uh, what we know on climate is, MOE got to write beautiful speeches for Abe, but <laughs> Mitty was calling the policy and was not on board and was like, no, it, it's uh, like crazy. Can't happen, right? So this time, is it one of those two where there's a, and, and it happened before on the, the DPJ, right? Yeah. They came up just before 2009 Copenhagen with a beautiful plan. Mm -hmm. But when I did the interview at Mitty, he's like, no, it won't happen. None of it is his priced and prepared and action plan and all of it. Uh, so is it one of those again, or is there something more real there this time? Mm -hmm. um, so, to, I mean, to the first question, I mean, I think that was, I mean, I, I have to think that just given the timing of it, you know, that, and in fact, the decision-making about those appointments was put into motion before um, Suga had even 
um, succeeded Abe um, that, you know, that had to be uh, a leftover. And, and, you know, and we saw all the kind of the kind of clues leading up to it, that the fact that there had been um, a cabinet legislation bureau uh, opinion written about um, what exactly the, pre- the prime minister's power was uh, when it came to these appointments uh, written several years before, you know, that apparently that several positions had been left unfilled previously. I mean, that there were lots of signs that this was something the Abe government had been thinking about um, moving towards, um, you know, and, and the ease with which you've seen, I think, certain right wing members of the LDP um, trot out their their problems with the Science Council um, suggest, you know, this is something they've been thinking about for a while. I mean, I haven't gone back to look to see, you know, um, you know, what other little, you know, were there opinion pieces or, or just other comments, you know, suggesting that this was um, an institution that was in their sites. Um, but I, I mean, I think all accounts suggest that was the case. Um, you know, we, the, you know, of course, it was reported um, that it's not clear that Suga even saw the list that had the, the names of those who were rejected, um, you know, suggesting that the decision was made um, before it even got to his desk. Um, you know, so it's, you know, frankly, you know, it looked like it was going to be a bigger deal. And, you know, before the diet session had started, we thought, okay, maybe this is going to take up uh, a lot of oxygen. Um, and I think between the fact that it is a, you know, it's a fairly minor institution, it's not something, you know, you ask the average Japanese and not exactly an institution they're thinking about a lot of, uh, or they have uh, major opinions about one way or another. Um, you know, so this is not this is not really that big of an issue. Uh, the LDP um, threw a lot of other arguments out there to distract from the from the main issue, which was why did you know why were these names rejected? Um, you know, and so they they came up with lots of arguments about why the institution should be privatized and it's a waste of public funds, and of course the government should have some say over you know who's on it because of that, and um, and so I think they managed to to kind of throw enough flack into the air, so to speak. Um, and then also the fact that just, you know, you did have a third wave of COVID that I think um, has consumed a lot more public attention and is, of course, a much bigger issue um, than the Science Council. So I think it's it's hasn't quite been um, you know, the, the issue that it looked like it was going to be uh, when it first surfaced. Um, you know, now, of course, we're all wondering, you know, what does it mean that, it, you know, if it appears that, um, you know, Abe's aides are due to be indicted, um, you know, what will that mean for Suga? You know, is Suga going to be, um, is it going to, you know, exact a price for, you know, on his popularity because of, you know, his close association with Abe and, you know, is he going to have to work to distance himself? Um, you know, that I think is to be decided, but it's definitely something to watch over the next few weeks, you know, depending on what, the uh, Tokyo public prosecutors decide to do. Um, so all of that is something to watch. Um, the climate, um, the climate change uh, announcement from Suga is so fascinating for me. I mean, as you know, I write in the book um, that you know, when looking at Abe's legacy, um, you know, climate change. I, I think is you know, if you're looking at things Abe didn't do, uh, that's got to be top of the list. You know, and and you, and, you know, when when people look back. Um, 10, 15, 20 years uh, from now um, at Abe's tenure. And I, I mean, I have to think, you know, given the direction that the climate seems to be going and the fact that Japan is not going to be able to escape uh, the consequences um, and you're, you're already seeing stronger storms and, and more severe heat waves and so on. Um, and, you know, I, I have to imagine his legacy uh, is going to be overshadowed by uh, inaction on climate. You know, the fact that he was, um, you know, you know, for a good stretch of his tenure, the strongest leader in the G7, um, you know, had very little domestic opposition, um, you know, was unusually stable globally, you know, and, and really was able to wield global leadership. And it just looks to me like just missed opportunities. I mean, he said the right things, um, you know, as, as climate villains from this decade, this past decade go, I mean, Abe um, is not, uh, you know, is not at the top of that list by any means or even high on that list. Um, but you, you do wonder, you know, for example, um, in 2015, I mean, the way I think about it, you know, 2015 Abe, you know, they announced that they're going to, you know, it's Abenomics 2.0 and the focus is going to be demographics and, um, you know, okay, we, we really have to focus on, on uh, reversing the demographic crisis. And, you know, had they said, okay, Abenomics 2.0 is going to be a green new deal, a Japanese green new deal, um, you know, just as a, um, 
a, a focus for, for national policy and also as an example to other countries, you know, particularly also would have coincided with uh, the Paris Climate Accord. I mean, it just seemed like, like if it was ever going to happen, that would have been a moment for it to happen. Um, and, you know, Abe, I think um, for all of his strength, I think he always struggled um, in his relations with uh, Kedan Ren and, and big business, you know, that um, he offered lots of incentives to them. But when it came time to uh, give them sticks uh, instead of carrots, um, I think they, they were pretty good at shrugging off the sticks. And I think Abe was always reluctant to actually use them. Um, and so I think, you know, getting them to move on uh, climate issues is, I think, um, was, I, I think, difficult. And, and I think with that was also Meti. I mean, the fact that Meti, I think, did not want to uh, invest um, in that kind of approach. And so, of course, you know, Suga comes into power. Uh, it's sort of the signature uh, feature of his first policy speech, the diet, um, you know, earlier, earlier in the fall. Um, and, you know, the fact that he was able to make that pledge and then repeat it um, in international fora, I mean, that, that's not everything, but it is something that I think the you know, Japanese governments tend to take seriously. And I think the fact that China, um, that China and South Korea and, you know, with a new U.S. administration, you might also get a, a different U.S. approach. And you put all those together that um, there really is, you know, there going to be some pretty strenuous competition um, for market share in, in all sorts of green technology. And, and I think, you know, if you want to get METI interested, that's, that's certainly a way to do it. And then, um, you know, really investing um, in moving Japan um, into, uh, into new sectors, into high, you know, high tech, high productivity sectors. Um, you know, that's music to METI's ears. But it's also a sign that just, you know, relatively speaking, relative to the Abe government. I mean, Meti's influence um, is more limited. There are other voices, um, you know, and, and Suga, I, you know, I think um, you, for as much as he wanted to emphasize continuity with Abe, I mean, I do think he has sought areas to make his own mark. And I think climate has been one of them. Digitalization has been another one. You know, I think he's focused on um, re, you know, rural, regional revitalization in ways that Abe, you know, talked about, but never, um, really put a lot of muscle behind. And so, I mean, I think it's, you know, it's emerged as I think an area where Suga could really distinguish himself and make a mark on his own. Um, and, and I think that probably part of the appeal to him uh, would be my guess, but I think there's an opportunity and, and I think it shows that Abe could have done more, um, you know, had he been willing to use his, his power uh, in a way that I think he was just too reluctant uh, to mm -hmm. do so. But on climate and on digitization slash anti Honko campaign. Uh, <laughs> it, will Suga get the credit, or is it on one hand Koizumi Jr., on the other hand Konotaro, who are the the, the rising new generation that are actually <laughs> driving those horses, right? Uh, well, or is he relying on them? But <laughs> well, well, really, what the, the credit really should go to Kanagawa Prefecture because you realize all three of those politicians <laughs> are all from Kanagawa. So apparently, uh, you know, it, it is now Kanagawa's time to rule Japan. Um, which is fine. I mean, I've lived there. Kanagawa is a great place. Um, no, I mean, I, I don't think I don't think at this point he's been overshadowed. I mean, I think he's willing. To, I think Suga actually um, has been pretty smart, recognizing that. I mean, both both Kono and Kozumi with their um, their public presence. I mean, you know, Kono as you know the the sort of master social media user. Um, you know that that I think Suga has recognized that they're both valuable, and you're putting them to work. Um, and, and borrowing their popularity to advance policy issues um, can only help him. I don't. I haven't seen anything to suggest that Koizumi is going to be in a position to take the credit on this. I mean, maybe down the road, you know, as he uh, builds a resume that would enable him to compete for higher office. I mean, I think this will help him. Um, you'll be given given this work to do. Um, you know, and and with Kono, I mean, I think you know. Suga basically said, you know, and there was discussion early on um, when, you know, there was there was some questions about, okay, well, Suga had been or Kono had been the foreign minister and the defense minister. And isn't this a, a demotion? Um, but, you know, there, there were comparisons, you know, back to Nakasone, who uh, before the, his his job before becoming prime minister had been administrative reform minister. So uh, there is some precedent of um, it. it um, being a stepping stone, and and I think Suga is going to use Kono, um, you know, to do you know important work. And if you look at the, um, you know, I, I really suggest uh, if people on this call read Japanese and have not seen it to read the uh, the new stimulus package 
um, that the Suga government just put out or just approved uh, today or yesterday in Japan, um, which really I think is a blueprint um, to what, I mean, I guess what you might just call Suga's third arrow, you know, the kind of policies that were under the third arrow during the Abe years, you know, really what Suga wants to do. Um, and I mean, it's work for Koizumi and it's work for, for Kono. And that is not, you know, I, I think he is um, smart enough to kind of use them, but um, they're going to, they're going to work. I mean, they're, they're going to, they have jobs to do um, to actually get these policies uh, over the finish line. And, and, you know, Suga, I think ultimately above all else, you know, if you look at him as a politician, you know, he is someone who wants to deliver results to the public. I mean, he's made very clear, um, you know, that was his, you know, his slogan upon campaigning and upon becoming prime minister. But I think, you know, you'll look back, um, people who, who follow me on Twitter will know this, you know, I did a, a very long thread reading through his, his book. Um, and I mean, it is very dry and very dull, but the theme that, that, comes through this you know this is a book he wrote in 2012 um you know he is he is laser focused on um you know getting into the weeds on policy and using um you know policy making tools to make life better for for the japanese people and and you know ultimately i think that's what he's going to care most about and uh, biden we need to say something about the <laughs> u.s election how does it change the landscape for japan for suga uh in what ways what are the most salient differences uh what could lie ahead i mean i think it lowers the stakes a lot for suga and and you know man you know look the most important job for a japanese prime minister maybe overall certainly in foreign policy is getting the relationship with the united states right and um you know I, look abe i think deserves a lot of credit for the ways in which he kind of figured trump out and managed him and you know there's lots of you know lots of discussion about well did you know what did abe really have to show for that um, but I think you really have to think about the counterfactuals and, and the way things could have gone quite differently. Um, and, you know, so Suga is not going to have, I mean, I, you know, I think he will not have a problem. I think uh, having a, a good working relationship with Biden, I think they're both professionals. They've both been in politics for a long time. Um, you know, they both, I think have a, you know, a pretty clear idea of what uh, the role of the, the U S Japan relationship in the region should be. Um, you know, you have plenty of people around, you know, Biden, who are uh, experienced and you know, know the alliance, you know, were, were involved um, in alliance management um, during the Obama years, particularly, you know, after, um, you know, after Abe came back and you know, there, was, there were some issues that had to be uh, smoothed, smoothed over. Um, and, and so, you know, it's, it's a normal U.S. administration, which means that, yes, you know, they're not going to agree on everything. I'm sure there's going to be, um, you know, areas of friction that will have to be managed, but I think they'll be confident that they will be able to manage those, those, those issues. And you're going to have, you know, a U.S. administration that really sees value um, in cooperating with allies like Japan and really will look to Japan to do a lot of work, um, you know, advancing U.S. interests in the region. And, you know, much as the Obama administration really did uh, as far as um, U.S.-Japan relations went uh, during the basically during uh, Obama's second term. Um, so that, I mean, that really is the main, the main thing. I mean, I think had Trump won re-election, um, you know, immediately Suga was going to be dealing with, um, you know, Trump's demands for Japan to pay a whole lot more to host U.S. forces uh, in Japan. You know, uh, immediately the stakes in those negotiations, I think, are much lower with the, with the Biden administration. Um, you know, it's you just I don't think anyone really even knew what a, tr a second Trump term would look like, um, you know, as far as alliances and, and um, Asia and just the U.S. role in the world is concerned. And so you're not having to face that, I think, already makes uh, Suga's life a lot, a lot easier. Yeah, that's that's great. I thank you for keeping uh, keeping at all those questions. So now we're turning to Q&A and we have a, a few good questions that have come up. Uh, so we could take them, uh, you know, one by one. Uh, the first one is actually on RCEP. Uh, it's from Parker. Uh, following your TPP slash China Japan comments, can you comment on the role that Japan played in RCEP? Could RCEP become one of the examples of how you think Japan, together with other democracies and partners, could co-opt China? Is co-opting another term for not offending? I'm thinking that the current China-Australia conflict, you know, I'm, what the current China-Australia conflict would mean to Japan. So some reflection there. Uh, a lot of a lot of pieces to that question. It's a really good one. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I, th I think it's very clear that RCEP was 
you know, was always a lower priority than TVP. I think it's still a lower priority uh, than TVP. I mean, I think, um, you know, as long as it, was out, as it was out there and as long as it was something that was very important to ASEAN, I mean, there was no way I think Japan was going to sit it out. Um, but I think, you know, Japan's role for, for quite a, a decent stretch, I mean, certainly after TPP was concluded, um, was to slow, was actually to kind of put the brakes on RCEP in some ways, you know, by insisting or at least trying to uh, raise the, the standards and to, and to get some of the the higher, you know, the, the more advanced um, rules that you saw in TPP to get kind of similar chapters um, in RCEP. Um, you know, I think towards the end, you know, I think Japan was was dismayed by India's exit, um, you know, and, and trying to uh, find a way to get India back in, I think was another, you know, factor um, for Japan. Um, but, uh, you know, I think the, you know, the, the, the main thing to note really is that it was just a lower, um, you know, a lower priority um, as far as uh, Japan's trade policy is concerned. And really, I think what you, you know, what you're seeing now, okay, RCEP's done, and Japan is immediately now focused on, okay, how do we get new members in the TPP, you know, whether that's going to be the UK, whether that's going to be Thailand, um, you know, some other, other potentials out there, um, you know, and, and, I, and I think really, um, that really is going to be where Japan's energies are focused, um, you know, RCEP also is, you know, it's, it's, it's much about rationalizing, uh, a re, you know, a, a bunch of overlapping and competing um, bilaterals, you know, and ASEAN, you know, having bilaterals with a bunch of different trading partners and, and getting them all on the same page. I think there's still a lot of value for Japan from it. I think, you know, particularly because um, of uh, what the rules of origin chapter ended up being, um, you know, given Japan's supply chains, um, you know, I think there's a lot that, um, Japan might end up getting out of it because of that. But, um, you know, I, I don't think we should lose sight of the fact, you know, lose sight of where our set fit in the overall um, picture as far as Japan's trade policy goes. Excellent. Um, then uh, we have a, a question from uh, Yosuke-san in Japan. Uh, Abe sometimes took a pragmatic approach to economic issues and relations with China that might be criticized by conservatives. Mm. Do you think that it should be regarded as a consistent ideologue after all? Mm. Also, what do you think of why many conservatives continue to support Abe despite those pragmatic moves? Uh, the abduction issue explains all of this. You know, did he <laughs> give signals? You know, it's like he's keeping his, yeah. What signals did he give him, et cetera? Smart question. Well, yeah, no, it's, it's well, and it also, it also, it, it speaks to, um, one of my favorite sort of threads from the book and, and arguments that I, that I kind of come back to in the book. Um, and, and that is, you know, that one of the things I, I discovered and was very actually impressed by um, um, Abe as a first term diet member in 1996 writes this essay and a collection of essays by some other conservatives. Um, I've got it somewhere behind me. Um, and he's it's sort of like his, his, uh, credo, you know, he's laying out his principles and what he believes as a conservative politician. Um, and he, uh, to my, I mean, when I, when I found it, I was, I was like almost taken aback because obviously doesn't always, you know, he's not, um, you know, he's not a bookish politician. He's not someone who really show, you know, is someone who, um, is overly erudite. I mean, this is not, he's not just, that's just not the kind of politician he's often seen. Um, but in this essay, he, um, he discusses uh, Max Weber and, and politics as a vocation at length. And, you know, talking about, um, you know, politics as being about uh, the, the head as much as the heart and, you know, the balance between, um, you know, the, the conviction, uh, the two different convictions. And, and, you know, in this essay, Abe talks about how his grandfather Kishi was the perfect example of this. Um, but what I thought was interesting was that I think you, if you look at that, um, that I think throughout his career, Abe was always striving to find that balance between his convictions and the sort of the, the, the need to be focused on reality and outcome. And, you know, that, that he couldn't always be so concerned uh, about um, achieving his ideological goals that he lose, loses sight of, um, of political reality and the realities of, of wielding political power. And, you know, to be sure, he did not always succeed in that. And I think uh, the story of 2006, 2007, in many respects, um, is his inability to really strike that balance, um, even though I, I think there are signs that he was still trying. Um, but this was something that I think he was always thinking about. It was, you know, that how do you, um, you know, 
wield power effectively and also you know, also realize your ideals. Um, you know, I, I think in this vein, I think he also was was uh, inspired by the Meiji uh, elites in many respects. I mean, I think that's you know his his uh, origins as a uh, a son of Yamaguchi, even if he didn't literally he didn't literally grow up there. But um, you know, I think it, it, the the connection to the Meiji Restoration was actually very important to him because I think they embodied that type of politics as well. You know, recognition that. Um, you know, sort of realism in pursuit of the national interest, that the overriding goal is Japan's security and its prosperity. And that in pursuit of that, that, you know, requires a certain amount of flexibility and a, and a willingness to bend your ideals uh, in the interest of, of the larger goal. And, and I think you can find lots of examples of Abe's willingness to do that. I mean, I think recognizing there were times to, to work with China um, was one of them. Um, you know, I think, he, you know, his willingness to, I think, not push, you know, on constitution revision, um, when, when the political reality suggested that it was not a winner, um, I think he was willing to hold back, even though it was something that I, that I don't doubt its importance to him and its personal importance to him. I think he was willing uh, to hold back on that. I, I mean, I think the fact that he wasn't, in, as I mentioned, I mean, that, that I don't think he was instinctively a globalist, but recognized that Japan's uh, security and its prosperity really depended on opening Japan to the world. I, I think he committed to that and stuck to it. Um, even though I think a lot of people to his right did not support that, and you know, didn't, were not necessarily uh, fans of TPP, for example, um, and, and Abe pressed ahead with that anyway. Um, you know, same thing goes for uh, changing, uh, basically creating a, a guest worker program of sorts. Um, you know, which was actually a lot of to some, to a great extent was actually Suga's project. I mean, Abe faced a lot of criticism from the right on that, and nevertheless uh, stuck with it. Um, and I mean, I think to the extent is what that says about his relationship with the right, I think there are a few things. I mean, one, um, where were they going to go? I mean, I, I think there really, um, there, there, there really was no alternative. I mean, Abe, Abe, um, I, I think had, uh, you know, was the, the sort of champion of the conservative movement. Um, there was nowhere really for them to go. I mean, certainly all the attempts to create conservative third parties from earlier in the, uh, in the century. I mean, those have all fizzled out, um, and, and you know, really that, that Abe was sort of the only game in town. Uh, but I think a lot of conservatives, I mean, yes, I think there are people, you know, sort of the uncompromising idealist on the right. But I think there were a lot of other conservatives who sort of shared um, his approach, you know, recognition that there are times where you do have to be willing to bend your ideals in the interest of the larger goal of kind of national strength and national prosperity. Uh, and, and that really is the, you know, staying focused on that. And, and I, so I don't necessarily, you know, I think people could understand the compromises he was making that it wasn't, um, you know, it wasn't that he suddenly stopped believing these things, but that, you know, the, that really keeping an eye on the bigger picture was a big part of who Abe was as a politician. Fascinating. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, so then we have an important question on something we haven't brought. Uh, gender. How would, rate, how would you rate Abe on gender equality and, of course, womenomics and all this and beyond that, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you know, I think, I think sometimes I think the record is more mixed than sometimes people give him credit for i mean usually when people talk about it it's entirely negative and you know that he had you know sort of over over promising and under delivering um you know particularly when it comes to um women in politics you know and the fact that the ldp uh you have just not seen uh the kind of advancement um from female politicians that uh that you had hoped and you know there was no no embrace of a quota for candidates for example um and, and all of that is true and, and i think he um yeah, you know, that that is you know unfortunately you know that is part of his legacy, um, but I think there are a few positive things you can point to. I think first of all, um, we've you know we've talked several times now about the cabinet personnel bureau and the, the Abe government taking more control over personnel appointments. And one thing that I think was a consistent factor uh, or a consistent um, trend. Uh, throughout the Abe years was the willingness uh, of Abe and Suga to use that personnel power to appoint women to high to high positions in the bureaucracy uh, that they'd never necessarily been in before. So, uh, you know, kind of you had new you know, women becoming bureau chiefs uh, in all sorts of ministries that they hadn't uh, become before uh, the you know, first female administrative vice ministers in, in some ministries. Uh, 
you look at, and this, I don't necessarily, I don't know how much you can actually credit the Abe government for this, but when you look at who is entering the Japanese bureaucracy, um, there are more women in the entering classes uh, than pretty much ever before. Um, you know, more women are taking the entrance exam, more women are passing it and um, entering the bureaucracy. And some of that might just be that um, they might just find the Japanese bureaucracy a more attractive uh, employer, maybe to, you know, than, than some other uh, private sector employers, maybe. Um, and also it might reflect that um, more women or more men are, are now uh, either not going to the bureaucracy or leaving sooner. Um, but be that as it may, I mean, as those women, you know, they're going to rise through the ranks and they're going to they're going to find their way into, into higher positions. And so not too long from now, I mean, the Japanese bureaucracy is going to look very different uh, than it has ever really before. Uh, and that is going to be part of Abe's legacy. I think, you know, that, that you really did see this change during the Abe years. Um, I also should point out, I mean, the fact that um, uh, you did have um, more women enter the workforce uh, than ever before. You know, more women now, at least before the pandemic, um, you know, than, than in the United States, for example. Um, that's a mixed legacy as well. I mean, a lot of those jobs, you know, are, are non-regular work. And, um, you know, as I think the struggle for working styles reform suggests, I mean, I think um, with more women in the workforce, you know, the, the, it became even more imperative to change uh, office culture in Japanese corporations so that, um, you know, not only can women stay in the workforce, enter the workforce and stay in the workforce, but then actually have conditions that enable them to rise, you know, that if you have an office culture that requires everyone to go out drinking after work and, you know, to work, you know, enormously long hours and overtime hours, I mean, you're going to, it's just, you're, you're going to make it very hard for women um, to advance in, you know, to, to higher positions. And so, um, you know, I, I think we're now kind of in an interesting moment where there's probably been more working styles reform in the last, you know, eight months or so uh, than in the three years uh, preceding it when the Abe government had really made it a priority. And so we'll really have to see how much of those changes stick and how much uh, you know, the, the Suga government and, and subsequent governments can push that agenda forward. Um, but there's, I mean, the Abe government left a lot of unfinished business on the women on its front. I mean, uh, there's no question, you know, I, I think there's still a lot of stigma around men being more active at home, which of course, I mean, you know, I, from personal experience, I mean, if you want to, you know, give women opportunities in the workforce, I mean, men have to be willing to step up at home um, and do more to, to care for children and, and to keep house and, you know, that you can't have it so that women, you know, come home from work and immediately have to clean up the house and wash the dishes and prepare the food and, you know, everything, you know, that, that, you know, that you really need um, cultural change um, that I don't think has quite happened yet. But again, we'll, we'll have to see what Japan looks like um, over the course of this decade. But some of that is just beyond the scope of what Abe was able to do. Mm -hmm. I see uh, someone raised the blue hand, uh, Masayo-san. Uh, would you like to say something? Mm -hmm. uh, do we have a way to let you speak? Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, you can. Uh, say I let you. So, Masayo-san, if you like, you can uh, jump in. I'm pretty sure you had something to add on this question. Would you like to say something? No. no. Hi, yeah. Sensei. That's that's mistake. Sorry. <laughs> Oh, okay. Well, no worries. <laughs> okay, Great to have you here. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you probably would know more. You know <laughs> no. for sure. <laughs> very, very interesting to hear his views. <laughs> Eye opening. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Masayasa. Um, we have uh, a, a last question here by Ryan. Oh, there's actually another one. Uh, on the emperor, so uh, a special question. Uh, during the, the, the peak of Abe year, right? Abe uh, control, uh, when there was lack of opposition but from the DPJ, what role do you think the emperor had in occasionally checking some of Abe's ideas, if ever, right? Uh, or did the emperor have any uh, such unofficial limited role, you know, whether it's the signaling or through yeah. very, you know, indirect signs as you <laughs> <laughs> um I, you know i um i i tend not to think about you know the politics of the imperial house all that much um 
you know, because on, I, I mean, look, when it comes to the issues and, and a political agenda and a policy agenda, I mean, the, you know, the emperor is not, you know, whatever the emperor's personal views were and, you know, there are stories about um, maybe friction and, and times when uh, the, uh, the Heisei emperor expressed um, uh, his personal views being at odds, perhaps with the prime minister's views. Um, I don't think that really uh, was a factor. Um, I mean, it's hard to think of a way in which that would have convinced Abe to do something that he didn't otherwise want to do. Um, that's just not, I mean, if you want to talk about sources of opposition um, during the Abe years, and we've already kind of talked about the ways in which uh, local governments and, and courts and um and prefectural governments have, have been able to check the Abe government or were able to check the Abe government in various ways. I mean, the other factor, and, and I wish I'd talked about it more in the book. I mean, it, it comes up in sort of critical moments here or there, but Komito, I mean, you know, the story of Abe, you know, that oftentimes the most effect, you know, uh, if, the, if Abe was being forced to back off on something or to compromise, often it was Komito, um, behind it and, and Komito pushing back and, you know, that Abe really um, found it difficult to um, defy Komito. Uh, I mean, there were, you know, he could push and he could try to, you know, force them to go along with him, but they usually were able to extract concessions at various points in time. Um, and so that really is, you know, that, that it probably deserved more uh, of a starring role uh, in my book than I gave it. Um, and right. one of my regrets. On the constitution issue, actually, you know, after he won, especially 20, uh, 2017, right, the last election, yeah. uh, and, and, you know, it, it was pretty cl- I mean, obviously, I had the majority in the lower house and upper house, you know, with, with Cometo and, and other small parties, it looked like he could have pushed it, right? So in the end, the fact that he didn't push the constitution, mm-hmm. is it Cometo or is it the worry of public opinion and, and losing the referendum? Or is it a uh, crowded agenda and you had to do other things first, like the emperor succession? And other- <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, no, I, mean it, I think, I mean, there's also, I think a real, there was a fundamental dynamic to, um, and this, this is, you know, about the referendum and public opinion as well, that, you know, you did have this informal rule that constitution revision should be kind of an all party thing. You know, it shouldn't just be, you know, one party pushes it through and, and gets it done. And so, you know, that I think, you know, because there had been this, this informal understanding, um, you know, I think there was a sense that if, that breaking that norm, um, you know, that you, you could sort of win the diet, you'll get the, the, get revision through the diet. Um, but if you do it in such a way uh, that leads to a public backlash and guarantees defeat when a referendum rolls around. And, and I think there was that dynamic. There was never really a way around that. And the other thing is, I, I think it was always interesting that constitution revision generically pulled pretty well. But then when, when people were asked, do they support Abe constitu- constitution revision under the Abe government, that was always much less popular than constitution revision in the abstract. And I think there was always because of Abe's uh, zeal for it, I think there was always something a little off-putting to the public about it. And, you know, they were not necessarily, they never just trusted Abe on it. Um, Even after, you know, he comes out in 2017 with some pretty mild amendments, you know, and says, we're not going to follow the LDP 2012 constitution draft, you know, that really uh, raises lots of alarm bells. Um, Even then he's unable to really shift opinion in his, in his favor. And, you know, the, just, the, the stars just never aligned. Um, and, you know, so Comito was part of that, um, but public opinion was part of that. You know, the political calendar, the fact that the world just looked um, so unstable after 2017, it's just like things never really aligned. And also in the upper house, you know, everyone always, you know, after 2016 said, oh, Abbey's got his two thirds majority in the upper house, constitutional revision is sure to happen. Um, the fact was that getting the LDP, Comito and Ishin, uh to agree on a for, on what revision should look like, uh, let alone trying to get some buy-in from the opposition. I mean, that was not going to be, that was going to be a heavy lift. It was never going to be easy, uh, you know, and certainly people assumed it was going to be so much easier uh, than it ever was going to be. And that remains the case. And, and I'd be surprised if, if Suga spends much political capital, if, if any, uh, trying to move it forward. 
All right. Uh, th there's still questions, but uh, time is up. We shouldn't uh, keep exhausting you. <laughs> this was fascinating. Uh, Tobias, thank you so much for all those insights and those very frank responses and uh, this incredible coverage. Uh, all the insights you have gained over the years are really fascinating, and it shows uh, the closeness of your observation. And it's rare that very, very few, if any, uh, outside Japan uh, who uh, we have this close reading. So uh, thank you very much for being uh, with us, and uh, we look forward to real visits in the future. I hope so. Thank you. Thank you really for it. Was, it was a great conversation. And also, if anyone has the book, um, I, I can say that if they want, I have... Um, I can send signed book plates to people. So if you want, uh, if you have a copy, I mean, unfortunately I can't sign in person, but if you want a signed copy, um, you can send my, send me an email or go to my website. There's contact information there, observingjapan.com. And I will happy, happily send anyone a signed book plate. So just wanted to put that out there. Ah, that's very clever. Good innovation. <laughs> and uh, do you, have you put your hunko on it? <laughs> uh, well, no, I'll just tell them. Boy, it's obsolete. All right. Yeah. Um, right. Okay, thank well, you. thank you. Very much, Tobias. Great, Great pleasure.